All right, well, uh, welcome to the Hawaii Cannabis Expo. Um, I am Joseph Saracides, and I am the founder and president of Immortal Nine LLC. Um, it's a company that I've recently started to provide a host of different products that focus on regenerative therapies, focused around different species of medicinal mushrooms. I have a very extensive background in medical mycology. I was originally trained by Paul Stamets at Fungi Perfecti Labs well over 20 years ago. I uh, have a, a, a background as well in mental health and nutraceuticals and commercial biotechnologies. I'm also a, a Native American uh, sun dancer, and I've spent a lot of time doing indigen, in, indigenous healing practices in the Pacific Northwest. Um, ultimately, uh, much of my, my, my knowledge, my research, has been uh, on the ground floor in the temperate rainforests um, up by Mount Shasta and the Siskiyou Mountains. If you guys are familiar with the Cascade region, it's a really amazing bioregion filled with an incredible um, variety of different species of uh, endemic and endangered species from you know, fungi to plants alike as well as the indigenous people of those lands. Um, I am also the author of Biological Resonance, Thriving in a Radioactive Universe. I wrote that almost, yeah, 15, 20 years ago now. Um, but it's uh, very much pushing the cutting edge of the research surrounding aging and degenerative diseases that are running rampant around the planet um, as a result of much of our Western uh, lifestyle. Um, as I said, I was uh, a student of Paul Stamets, and I um, worked along his, uh, alongside him for almost a decade. Uh, I actually got to edit his book, Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. And there he is actually in British Columbia on Cortez Island in the middle of absolute gorgeous nowhere, um, calling in on his sat phone the last edits that I made to his book uh, into the publisher. Um, and so I've been doing this work quite a bit. You guys might have seen some of his work on Netflix and uh, documentaries, uh, you know, series that you've probably seen him on in, in, in the support and promoting medicinal mushrooms. I've also published works through the National Institutes of Health um, Encyclopedia of Dietary Supplements with the former editor-in-chief <laughs> of the International Journal of Medicinal Mushrooms. Uh, his name is Dr. Solomon P. Wasser, as well as co-authored the paper with a man named Dr. John Holliday, Matt Cleaver, and Moitza Tynik. Um, they also were involved, uh, all of us rather, in a United Nations contracting to over 57 countries to provide f um, mushroom formulations to over um, 57 countries for HIV and hepatitis C medications, um, where they are registered as biopharmaceuticals. In the United States, of course, the FDA has not approved the use of medicinal mushrooms for the treatment or prevention of any disease. Um, these are the types of labs that I was trained to build. These are biotechnology facilities. That is a pressure vessel about the size of a 40-foot submarine, and um, that's how we sterilize our media. And so we can take lots of different types of materials, whether they be grains or hardwood sawdust or things of that nature, and we can put tons of this into this machine and basically pressure cook it. It's a submarine-sized pressure cooker, which allows us to sterilize the media that we feed the fungi in a laboratory. And it's not like growing, you know, plants in a garden. Uh, fungi are very specific in the growing conditions they need. So we have to grow them in sterile environments, or they will contaminate with different types of molds or mildews or bacteria. So we have to keep them very clean and sterile. Um, most people don't consider a mushroom farm being looking like a pharmaceutical laboratory. Um, but ultimately, that's really what we do is we grow them in petri dish uh, in cell cultures, and then we can propagate them. One single petri dish in that stack, one of those petri dishes could be propagated in 90 days, can produce a million pounds of mushrooms uh, grown in this way because they grow exponentially, right, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, these are the types of facilities that I design and I build in the commercial industry. We basically can take an empty warehouse and with, um, uh, you know, the ability to just uh, uh, create the floor plan, uh, ultimately establish a class 100 sterile clean room laboratory, which allows us to propagate large amounts of mushrooms. This is a, a sneak peek and look inside one of the, our, our laboratories, our primary clean rooms. And as you can see here, um, we're sanitizing the surfaces with alcohol and fire to basically burn off any dust or any types of uh, you know, particles that came off of a, 
paper towel or a cotton uh, you know, cloth uh, when we're wiping down because we really want to make those surfaces as sterile as possible. And there's another autoclave or a retort uh, that we use. And as, as you can see, actually, the dirty material goes in the back end and we cook it that you can see here in the middle. Um, and then the other material actually comes out. Um, that was an interesting sound. Uh, the, the, the dirty end uh, uh, is here, and the, you put the, the, the unsterile material, you close the door and cook it, and then once it's done cooking, this is inside the lab. So when we open the door, it's completely sterile. The, the material is not ever allowed to, to touch contaminated or dirty air. It is it, Actually, NASA is a class 10,000 clean room. We have class 100 sterile A clean rooms. We're quite a bit more sterile than NASA for satellite um, manufacturing, they have to have a dust-free environment, which is very easy to do. What we have to do is have a microbial-free environment, which is, which is significantly more of an intense lab. And so these are the types of labs that biowarfare are done in by, like, Fort Detrick in, in Maryland, um, and, uh, you know, all types of bio labs uh, utilize these types of uh, clean room uh, laboratories. Um, in any case, uh, we do have uh, Magic Spore Labs as a partner a company that has a booth right next door to ours, and they produce uh, high-quality uh, spore syringes. Um, more of my focus, actually, is in the realm of uh, medicinal fungi. Uh, these are some of the technicians that you can see working on actually inoculating many of these bags uh, in front of the uh, HEPA filter. This is called the spawn laboratory that you see there. And here you can see some of the petri dishes incubating, and we can grow the spawn out. And once we grow that spawn, we can then spawn larger volumes of material. So that single petri dish can inoculate all of these bags, right? So we can then have those bags inoculate more bags, and then they create a far more uh, larger expansion rate. Uh, again, an exponential expansion every time you're expanding by four, five, or ten. Um, this is my business partner, KT. You guys can see him at the booth uh, out there. Um, and just kind of give you an insight into some of the work that we do. Uh, this is actually a laser particle counter, and I can count the particulates of cells or dust or spores in the air, right? And this meter reads zero all the time in my lab. And so there are, it's literally the most sterile environment you can create on the surface of the earth. Now, getting into what I want to talk to you guys about, because I think a lot of people have interest in psychedelic mushrooms, but I want to kind of give you the history, um, modern history, rather. And Alexander Fleming was the first one who identified antibiotics by growing and culturing penicillin, which is, uh, uh, which is actually a, a penicillium chrysogenum is the name of the fungus that he was growing, and it was an accident. All of a sudden, he noticed these bacteria was growing in the dish alongside the penicillium, and then you can see this zone of inhibition. The bacteria does not want to touch the fungus, right? And that's because the fungus is producing antibodies, and that's where the, the source of the first penicillin or antibiotics came from was from a fungus, and it's one of the reasons why the Western forces, Allied forces, won World War II, because the, the Germans did not have antibiotics, and they were dying by, from, from, from infections in the trenches, whereas our troops were able to utilize antibiotics and not die from infectious diseases. And so, you know, uh, it, it was, again, Alexander Fleming who attributed nature to the actual producer of antibiotics, um, but it wasn't until, you know, 1928 that he discovered by accident that it was capable of killing bacteria. Now, the problem, there's a double-edged sword here. Bacteria do not kill, antibiotics do not kill fungi. They only kill bacteria. And as you can see here, I actually have a mold that came off of a, a gummy that I found uh, an old gummy that had some mold on it. So we're mycologists. We're weird. We see fungus and we're like, yeah, let's culture that. You know, a moldy piece of bread makes us excited. Um, and so we grew it in uh, standard agar. And you can see there's some bacteria in there and there's some, there's some fungal mold. But when we grew it on antibiotic agar, only the fungi was allowed to grow. The bacteria was killed, but the fungi thrived. So this is dangerous if you consume antibiotics because that means you'll kill all the bacteria, but you let the fungus grow. And not all fungi are good. 
right? A lot of different yeasts and common dermophytes that live on our bodies and in our intestines, right? Uh, commonly are, are, are present with everybody. There's not anyone on the earth that doesn't have microbes teeming inside of them. And so this is one of the things that I think really was a huge problem in most of our Western world as we began to misuse and uh, overuse antibiotics, because then it just created a, 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 a hellstorm of fungal infections that most people don't even know that they have. And we're identifying them as different diseases or inflammatory problems, autoimmune diseases that are resultant from the use of antibiotics without killing the fungus. And that can cause candidiasis, thrush. It can cause, uh, you know, um, different types of like athlete's foot or ringworm or dandruff. Those are all fungal related. Right. But they also have a very, you know, it's kind of a scary aspect to them, uh, which we're going to go into a little bit of that because fungal pathogens are now one of the top concerns from the World Health Organization kind of pushed COVID aside. And they're all realizing that these fungal pathogens are some of the most deadliest and difficult to kill creatures. We don't really have very uh, uh, um, effective med med medications to kill fungi. Uh, aspergillus, black mold. Who hasn't seen black mold in their life? In the bathroom, under a sink, on a piece of drywall. And we just paint over it and we don't think anything about it, right? And aspergillus is one of the most gnarliest creatures because they'll infect the lungs and they like to infect the brain. They like to get into the nervous system. Candida or, uh, uh, oris or albicans, very common in the gut, but it also grows throughout our entire body. Cryptococcus neoformans causes common brain infections for animals and humans alike. These are not friendly creatures, and they are flesh eaters, basically. And so fungal infections, again, most people just go, oh, it's an athlete's foot, it's on my toe. If it's on your toe, that means it's in your gut, it's in your organs, it's throughout your whole body. It's not just on the toe or just on the head or just on anywhere. These creatures don't respect boundaries or borders. They just see a body that is ripe with sugary good you know, goodness and, they, and, they, and, and lots of fat and, and, and proteins and carbohydrates that they need for their metabolism, and they just start to <coughs> dine on us, um, which is, again, we call them parasites or flesh eaters. This is actually a very common illness that's, that's commonly misdiagnosed um, as a result of mold exposure from the spores that we inhale or breathe whether we're walking down the street or we go into a restaurant that had some mold events or an old brick building or our own home, mold is everywhere. It's not something we can get away from, but what happens is that it creates chronic inflammatory response syndrome or SIRS, and that will create a cytokine response, an in inflammatory immune system response. And uh, this causes immune problems, hormone dysregulation issues. It causes systemic inflammation throughout the body. There's all kinds of different problems that fungi can cause. And the doctor maybe is not thinking about, oh, it's a fungal infection. Maybe they say, oh, it's arthritis. Oh, it's cancer. Oh, it's diabetes. Oh, it's all these other things. But it's actually underlying a fungal exposure or toxicity that is coming from mycotoxins or aflatoxin. And so aflatoxin can typically be, um, you know, uh, have symptoms of abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, cancer, uh, you know, depressed immune, immunity, kidney issues, liver issues, nausea. These are very common symptoms that people will just say, I don't know what it is, you know, what, what's causing it. And doctors will be perplexed because parasites are very good at evading um, diagnostic testing in the bloodstream or in urinalysis or other, any other ways to detect it um, unless you have an acute exposure to mold and you know that that is what caused it. Uh, but very rarely or most commonly, these things go unlooked, uh, overlooked and unaddressed. The metabolic acidosis symptoms are also something that come up frequently because as the fungus starts to digest our tissues, it ferments us. And that fermentation, like in vinegar or anything else, fermented food, becomes acidic. And so as our tissues be begin to acidify, it causes a lot of problems throughout the entire body. Um, it's systemically, it's a, it's a very bad situation. Um, and again, most of the Western world is suffering from a mild to, to, to an extreme grade of this 
problem of acid, metabolic acidosis uh, and or, you know, uh, fungal infections that are, again, undiagnosed and untreated, um, which is why I think many of the different, uh, not just diagnostics tools, but treatment programs and therapies for many different diseases are not effective because they're not actually targeting the root of the problem, which are fungal infections. And to illustrate this further, in the last two years, it was discovered that 35 types of cancer have fungal DNA at their core. The majority of them are intracellular. And so that's telling us that fungi and cancer have a very, very close relationship. Fungal infections and cancer is one of the biggest components to the cancer mystery, which everyone doesn't understand really what cancer is. And in my book over 20 years ago, I wrote at length about this um, this specific concern, not just cancer, but neurodegenerative diseases and all types of other uh, issues that come up with fungal infections that are undiagnosed and allowed to just run rampant. So as we can see, there's many different articles that came out showing that cancer uh, cells are filled with fungi. Um, the really amazing thing about this is that, you know, 2,000 years ago almost, Hipp Hippocrates uh, said it all in a single sentence. All disease begins in the gut. That is where it all starts. That is the function of disease is that when our microbiome becomes imbalanced and we get parasitic infections in our intestines, then they spread all types of havoc through the body. And so, you know, I think modern research is now showing very clearly that the, 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 the brain, we call it second brain, but I think it's the first brain in our gut, um, has actually more neuronal connections in our gut than it does in our brain. And so these two organs are linked to, uh, as, as, as closely as, you know, as any other um, organs in the body. I mean, these are, these are tied together from the nutrition that we get from our gut that actually feeds the fruit of our brain, right? That is what requi that's required for our body's metabolism to be able to absorb energy from the food that we use so our brain can function to operate our body. And so, of course, it's, they're connected. It's not, a, it's not a surprise. But, you know, we're looking at these connections now and realizing that fungi, being many millions to billions of years old, have figured out how to attack us in our most vital organ, which is our intestine, the colon. And we can see now that colorectal, uh, colorectal cancer, uh, inflama inflammatory bowel disease, uh, hepatic uh, liver disease, or pancreatic cancer, as well as Alzheimer's, and, and multiple sclerosis are all affiliated with these different species of fungi. Very common species, the ones that cause dandruff, <laughs> right? The ones that cause athlete's foot, the ones that cause tinea, um, you know, versicolor and, and vitiligo on the skin. And so when we're looking at these kinds of things, it's really important to understand that fungi aren't isolated or secluded to one place. They like to travel. They like to move through the landscape of the organs. And so when we're talking about you know, whenever I, I try to help people understand, whenever we're talking about cancer, I just want us to stop using this this really generic language. More specifically, it's it's an undiagnosed or untreated um, a, a fungal infection. And if we wanted to get more specific to find out what fungi it is, then you got to go and do some diagnostics to figure out which species. But at the end of the day, I kind of don't care what species it is. If it's eating my my body, I want it out. You know, and so I've developed many different uh, protocols um, in my health consultancy to address uh, elimination and providing the ability to counteract and combat many of the different issues that are associated with fungal infections. Uh, can't say I'm a doctor or that I treat or prevent any illness or disease, but providing the body's immune support that is needed to be able to do what it does best, which is fight pathogens, is really the key here. Um, and so again, the gut-brain axis is one of the biggest components of our health that we need to focus and pay attention to. You know. Uh, the vagus nerve is actually the nerve that goes from the brain and comes down and wraps around your, your, your organs, your intestines. And that's the, what signals the brain to basically do everything that the brain does, which is support the body's ability to function. Hippocrates also said, our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. And I couldn't agree more. And we look at here in Okinawa, Japan, is a blue zone. And a blue zone is referred to as uh, an area where people regularly live over 100 years old 
with very little disease and a high quality and standard of life. And in Okinawa, it was uh, uh, looked at by epidemiologists to find out why the traditional Japanese Okinawan diets were supporting such long life and, and, and uh, you know, basically avoiding many of the, de you know, degenerative health issues that come with aging. And what they found was that the majority of the Okinawan traditional diet was sweet potatoes and vegetables. And only about 2 to 5% of the diet was meat. Right? And not necessarily solely vegetarian, still ate fish, still ate different types of meat, I believe different types of uh, boar or pork, and, but it was always the majority of it was fiber. 70% to 75% of the diet was fiber-based. And we look at another blue zone um, here in Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, where I lived for the last uh, year or so, and um, you see the very similar, where you see a pretty much majority is plant-based, fiber-rich diets, and only about 5% meat, fish, poultry, so on and so forth, where you're not getting really above that 5% mark, which is very opposite of what we do in the West, where 90% of our food is animal-based. You know, And I'm not advocating for a vegan or vegetarian or, or, or carnivore diet. I'm just advocating for a balanced diet, right? Because we need all of those things to supply us our carbohydrates, our fats, and our proteins that we require. And all of our macro, micronutrients are, are essential uh, to get from all these food sources. Sardinia, Italy, another one where you see a very high intake of, of plant-based, um, not just any plants, but roots, tubers, high fiber um, uh, 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 produce. Uh, Loma Linda, California, another blue zone. Strange to be right down out of uh, Los Angeles. I believe it's Seventh Day Adventists uh, that, uh, that, that, you know, uphold a very strict diet. And you can see, again, much of this is almost 75%, um, you know, plant based, high fiber diet. Whereas, again, only 4 or 5% is meat. And so you're seeing a theme here as you look at these, at these, at these, these blue zones. Uh, even in Arcaria, Greece, uh, you can see clearly that we have, again, a very similar thing where only 5% meat, the majority, maybe 6% there's your fish, so they've got a little bit of a higher meat intake, but still the majority is fiber-based. And they've avoided cancer and diabetes and heart disease and many of these problems that have afflicted the majority of the Western worlds. Um, and it's sad that it's only five blue zones on the entire planet of, you know, the billions of people. Um, so it, it just gives us a little bit of a lesson to understand that the wisdom of the traditional, you know, uh, dietary practices is, is not to be neglected. We can't just reinvent the wheel and say, hey, stomach, just eat, you know, French fries and, and fried food and think that the body's not going to, you know, respond in a, in a negative way. Fiber works in many different ways. It actually balances and modulates cholesterol absorption. Uh, it helps to uh, basically modulate blood sugar um, and, and helps to basically provide the ability for the body to absorb fats and proteins to help them be digested through the, through the intestinal tract and keep the intestines and colon clear and free of debris that otherwise parasites will feed on. Um, now there are different um, types of compounds that fungi produce called beta-glucans. This is why people are starting to see fungi having such powerful effects against cancer. And the beta-glucan isn't some mysterious compound. It's actually just a fiber. It's a carcinostatic fungal fiber. And these beta-glucans are now being studied even in China PSK Crestin is one of the top anti-cancer drugs that is used by the pharmaceutical industry there in China, which is not um, approved here in the, by the FDA in the States. But nonetheless, you know, these are starting to see in shiitake uh, lentinin. I actually met uh, the inventor of lentinin um, of, of this particular compound that extracted it from shiitake. Uh, and they use that also as an anti-cancer drug. These are different again, beta-glucans, which are basically fibers from the fungi that are showing a very powerful immunomodulatory effect, benefiting the immune system and helping the body combat disease. The beta-glucan actually also feeds microbiome, the, the microbiome in your gut. The, the beneficial probiotic bacteria that are in your gut need food, and they don't eat meat, typically, 
They don't eat, you know, fats. They typically will eat fiber. The beneficial probiotics eat what are called prebiotic fibers. They need the prebiotics to grow, just like the seed needs soil. You can't just put the seed on the cement in the parking lot. It's not going to grow. It needs the prebiotic medium. Now, beta-glucan is the most optimal medium for the probiotic bacteria for them to produce short-chain fatty acids, most notably called butyrate. And that is what actually prevents colon cancer and all kinds of other issues uh, is the short-chain fatty acids that are made by the bacteria, but the body does not make it. So we need those bacteria to continue to make the short-chain fatty acids, and so we need to continually eat fiber to keep them happy. Because if we don't, we're going to get disease. That's just the way nature works. So moving on, you know, beta-glucan does a lot of things from lowering cholesterol, balancing blood sugar. It's beneficial for respiratory tract health. Uh, it provides a, a lift to your um, emotional state, your moods, uh, the healthy gut, of course, microbiome. And it also is well known for weight management. So uh, it's one of those things that helps the body elimination process and, uh, you know, is commonly used for, for dietary programs. Um, that's why I invented and formulated this product called um, Mortal 9 ProBiome Plus. And I used 14 different medicinal mushroom uh, fibers from mycelium to fruit body extract powders. Uh, for me, I had a lot of gut problems growing up and still into my adulthood, it ravaged me until I was in my 30s. And uh, there was no products I could find that can address it. So I formulated this for myself, to be honest with you. I never intended to sell it. Um, but as a result of the benefit it gave for, my, for me and my gut health, um, and I started giving it to friends and family, and all of a sudden we saw how much benefit it was providing to our community, we had pretty much everybody demanding that we create a product and make it available. So that's kind of how Immortal 9 was born. So going back to the antibiotics do not kill fungi, right? Antifungals do. We can see here that the uh, mold from the antibiotic agar was not affected here uh, in, the an in, in the antibiotics. It doesn't kill fungi. So if you take anti anti antibiotics, this is what your insides will look like, right? Because they will thrive. Now, this is an antifungal medication with these same cultures. And you can see it killed them. They didn't survive. And so this is why if ever anyone takes antibiotics, they should always co-administer an antifungal to prevent the fungus from overgrowing and causing cancer and all kinds of degenerative diseases. It's a simple thing, but most doctors will not do that because most doctors are not mycologists and they don't understand fungi. They just understand bacteria and pharmaceutical drugs that we use to control bacteria. Everyone just looked the other way while the fungi took over the world basically. And they've always been in control of the world. They've been, they've been here for billions of years. They, they, they know what they're doing. Um, so this is actually a very rare species, actually virtually extinct now. It's, it's, it's rare and endemic uh, endangered species of the Pacific Northwestern forest. There was only five places on the earth where it grew, um, and they were all in the Pacific Northwest from northern California, southern Oregon, up to British Columbia. But now they're pretty much all extinct due to deforestation and logging. So they cut down all the old growth forest. She can only grow on 500 year old trees and older, the silver fir and noble fir. And uh, I, I call her Grandma Bridgie, but her name is Bridgiporus nobilissimus. Um, and she is known in the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest mushroom on earth. She can grow up to uh, over 150 to 300 kilograms, right? She's a massive creature. And I, I, I learned to culture her um, and I won't talk too much about that because I could get in trouble from Paul. But um, so I, I, I cultured her and you can see her very clearly, right? I mean, she looks like her fruit body and she uh, has a symbiotic relationship with bacteria, yeast, fungi, with um, algae um, and all kinds of different commensurate organisms. And so she's a, a community is what she is as the she's basically the microbiome of the old growth forests of the Northwest. She's responsible for having cultivated all of these old growth uh, fir forests from Northern California all the way up to British Columbia. She's the mother or grandmother of the forests, right? And, and so what I decided to do was actually um, grow her on the antifungal antibiotic to see if it affected her. And she actually grew fine on it, whereas the other fungi did not, right? And I grew a black mold from the back alley of Compton 
Uh, <laughs> and, and I figured that was, a, that was a very good, strong culture. And uh, black mold, as we talked about, causes a lot of problems. Uh, in health, in the environment, in construction, it's just a nuisance and, and a danger uh, health risk for the world. Now, it did not have a problem with the antifungal antibiotic. So even if you took an antifungal, it won't kill all the fungi, just some of them. And the worst ones, like the black molds, are unaffected. And that's, a, that's something that the World Health Organization and the Center for Disease Control, they understand this. They understand that we don't have medications that can address this problem. And so what I'm doing at my labs with my technicians is that we're now co competing, uh, having them compete against each other. So here's Bridgiporus, Grandma Bridgie, growing and eating the black mold. You see her just, she's literally sending waves of mycelium to fully colonize this black mold creature. And so that means that she has very powerful, potent antifungal uh, antibiotics inside of her, just like Alexander Fleming had originally discovered antibiotics uh, by using you know, a common fungus from a moldy cantaloupe is what he got it from. This is from an old growth forest of the most rare and endangered species of the highest, you know, degree fungi that exist in nature. Um, and so I feel like this is a lot better of an of a opportunity to be able to develop very powerful and potent antifungals that can address the things that no drugs in the market currently can. And so it's one of those things that, you know, has been a life <laughs> passion and effort um, that is ongoing, and the research continues to unveil more and more secrets, you know, of, of life. Um, once you actually then start to kill off the fungi in the body, you can expect die-off symptoms. We call them Herxheimer reactions. So when you start killing the yeast and the other types of fungi, um, the body gets basically poisoned with different types of defense mechanisms that the fungi produce as they're dying. They can produce ammonia or aflatoxins or different types of mycotoxins that then make you feel very sick. And so you, it, it's their response as a parasite to try to make you stop taking whatever you're taking that's killing it. So it wants to make you feel as sick as possible so you stop eating. That's why when you get a flu or something, you don't feel like eating and you just sit there and just, I, you know, you just want to die. And, the, and, you know, whether it's a bacterial or, or viral flu, they love that. You know, they want to be able to take advantage of you while you're, weakened immune, while you're in a weakened immune state and you're not nourishing, you're not capable of nourishing yourself. They take full advantage, right? And so ultimately, these are things that can be expected um, when the die-off symptoms occur. Um, now, for thousands and thousands of years from all over the world, this is actually from caves in France uh, and, and Algeria and the Mesoamerica. You can see even here from the Greeks, um, uh, the, uh, even here in the, these uh, Mayan uh, mushroom stones um, that actually Paul has up on his mantle, which I told him, bro, give those back to the Mayans. What are you doing with those? You know what I mean? Like, those don't belong to you. Anyway, um, it's one of those funny arguments in the past. But, but just showing in, in, in ancient times, even in, in ancient uh, China, uh, imperial China, you know, these were forbidden for commoners to have. If a commoner had these mushrooms, like this one here is called the uh, lingzhi, or the Japanese refer to it as reishi, uh, is, a, is known as a mushroom of immortality. And if any commoner was caught in imperial China, they would have their heads cut off. Uh, this was restricted only for use for the for the imperial family because it was known to be able to basically cure disease and 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 you know be the 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 core ingredient to elixirs of immortality and so for many centuries for many millennia you know it's been very very coveted um, product that is now being commercially cultivated by the West but even in some of these older you know, uh, 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 works of art here, you can see even the, the, the Taoist sage holding the reishi, or, you know, you see them harvesting it, or they made beautiful uh, sculptures of that. Um, even uh, here you can see, in this next image, a dragon made of reishi, which is beautiful. I think it's really quite amazing. You know, and again, the art and the, the culture and the science uh, and the medicine that goes into this understanding is ancient. This isn't something that we're just making up as we go along that's new, you know? This has been going on for many thousands and thousands of years. 
And Jap the Japanese were the best at the cultivation of mushrooms, actually, and brought much of the mushroom cultivation to the Western world. And as it can be seen here, the shiitake log farms, where they take shiitake logs and plug them, um, and uh, and are able to culture, cultivate my you know the mycelium in the log and then fruit them. Uh, you can see some more here popping right out of the log. Uh, beautiful you know farm. It's a wonderful livelihood. I feel growing mushrooms just keeps you connected to the earth. It keeps you eating you know good food um, and and nutritious um, you know. Uh, uh, mushrooms and providing you with all of those carcinostatic fibers as we mentioned before. Uh, this is more of a commercial facility that's not growing on logs anymore. These are growing on blocks like you see near our booth out there. We have some uh, blocks that are, are cultivating, you know, different species. Um, and uh, it's, it's now being understood that mushrooms can help save the world. They have so many different properties, and I think a lot of people that are coming to the Cannabis Expo have a lot of interest in the psychotropic use or the psychedelic use. And it was actually the, 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 the credit of two people that changed history. That's Gordon Wasson and Maria Sabina. And uh, Gordon Wasson was uh, basically, uh, back in the 1950s, took a trip down to Oaxaca in Mexico and met Maria Sabina, and she fed him the first magic <clears throat> mushrooms that were exposed to the West, at least uh, to the academic community. And he was actually paid by the government uh, to do some research and to study, so it was a bit of a, like a CIA plant down there. But nonetheless, they brought the mushrooms back to the West, and then that basically spawned the 60s you know, a, a counterculture movement. Um, and Maria Sabina was actually ostracized by her community for sharing this knowledge outside of their tribes. Um, and, uh, but it's been a long-standing tradition for many thousands of years uh, by the Mayan and Aztec cultures, as we saw in their mushroom stones, you know, that these are, these are medicines that have been treated as sacred, visionary, healing. Um, you know, they, they, they consider them as alive. They don't, many other plants they don't consider as, as having a spirit. Although most indigenous cultures understand that everything has a spirit, but they really truly um, uh, uh, had an understanding that mushrooms, these particular ones, they refer to as teo nanakatl, as means flesh of the gods, was you know, some of the most advanced and conscious uh, uh, organisms on the planet. Um, Maria Sabina, what a sweet woman. You know, she says, cure yourself with the light of the sun and the rays of the moon, with the sound of the river and the waterfall, with the swaying of the sea and the fluttering of the birds. Heal yourselves with mint, with neem and eucalyptus. Sweeten yourself with lavender, rosemary, and chamomile. Hug yourself with a cocoa bean and a touch of cinnamon. Put love in tea instead of sugar and take it looking at the stars. Heal yourself with the kisses that the wind gives you and the hugs of the, <coughs> and the, hugs of the rain. Get strong with bare feet on the ground and with everything that is born from it. Get smarter every day by listening to your intuition, looking at the world with the eye of your forehead. Jump, dance, sing, so that you live happier. Heal yourself with beautiful love, and always remember, you are the medicine. And so, again, I just want to give credit uh, to the indigenous people who were responsible for bringing this counterculture movement, which I think is a lot of people have abused and have not exactly respected this medicine in the way that it should be. Um, and, and those of us in the indigenous community that understand how powerful these medicines are, we know that people if misusing them incorrectly could get lost and they don't come back. And so it's really important to use these medicines wisely uh, with a guide that's experienced that understands what they're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, these are some good reference materials on the or origins of much of what became the counterculture and, and use of psychedelic or psychotropic mushrooms in the West. Um, here's some Cubensis images growing from a block, and they're quite, they're quite beautiful, attractive mushrooms, right? And the policies that have been changing over the last 10 to 15 years are finally allowing, a, are finally allowing us to research the, the impacts of psilocybin mushrooms on the human physiology, but specifically the a neuroscience uh, that is causing the changes in the brain that create the hallucinogenic or euphoria or synesthesia effects that we experience as a, you know, a basically a trip, as we call it. Um, and looking at the safety of drugs uh, from Britain, this drug score, uh, a, a harm score out of 100, shows that actually <laughs> mushrooms is at the very bottom as far as risk and danger, right? So these are things that 
you know, when we consider the, the, the risk or harm that it can cause, you know, we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, was there not, uh, well, tobacco is right there, right? We're right up at the, towards the top of the list. Alcohol is right up at the very top. So when we're considering things that are easily obtainable at the local drugstore or market and we're restricting these, it sort of makes you think, you know, twice um, but again, we don't want everyone just eating handfuls of magic mushrooms and running around the streets. It's not safe. Um, so that, that does require some sensible, you know, regulation to make sure that people aren't just, you know, just losing their minds everywhere um, or finding them, their minds, rather, finding their spirit. Um, so serotonin is actually a, a, a almost identical uh, to well, psilocin, man. the active compound in the magic mushroom it's actually an analog of serotonin so a lot of people think that magic mushrooms are poisoning you and making you high and that, that that's what's going to cause you to have these issues uh, you know with, with with um with the psychedelic experience or a bad trip but actually it's 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 a neurotransmitter right and so it's it, like many other drugs like alcohol is poisoning you so you get drunk because it's poisoning your liver you know uh, uh, all these other drugs that that are being used are because the plant or the substance is trying to harm you it's a defense mechanism right so a lot of people doing ayahuasca or peyote or san pedro like those are defense mechanisms a plant would otherwise kill you if you didn't do it just right these aren't these mushrooms aren't trying to kill anyone they're just actually replacing your serotonin with psilocin and giving you a, a, a peek, a sneak peek into their world for about six to eight hours, right? Um, and uh, again, there's no known toxic dose, not to say you can't lose your mind uh, if you're not stable, especially. So those are things to consider. Now, when we're looking at the different active constituents, you know, psilocybin is what people mostly hear about, but when it's uh, phosphorylated, it becomes psilocin in the body. That's the active compound that the body uses uh, to metabolize uh, in the central nervous system. And there's different um, levels of uh, psilocybin experience. Uh, we call a microdose, you know, very small amounts of, you know, 25 uh, uh, milligrams, uh, 250 milligrams rather. So you have from, from 50 milligrams to 250 <coughs> milligrams, uh, a mini dose you know, you have uh, 250 milligrams to 750 milligrams. Uh, museum dose, they're referring to it here, is almost a gram and a half. And then a moderate dose, which I would actually consider a macro dose, is 2 to 3.5 grams. You are fully hallucinating at this point. You are not feeling or hallucinating much of anything at this microdose level. So these are actually very safe levels to take it without any noticeable effects. Um, and it does has shown that it has benefited a lot of different um, issues that I, I believe you know a lot of people are coming to seek uh, you know um, some some relief from whether it's depression or anxiety and things like that. Whereas uh, macro dosing or mega dosing has been shown to be very effective with cocaine addiction, tobacco addiction, uh, post traumatic stress syndrome, uh, all kinds of different things like that that require a much more of a clinical therapeutic approach. So PTSD is actually a very interesting field of study because there's very few drugs, there's actually no drugs that can do what psilocybin can do, which is why John Hopkins University is so excited to, to be doing the research they're doing, the military, the VA, they're all moving into this study, into these studies because they're realizing how powerful effects psilocybin has under controlled their, you know, clinical conditions. Um, we can see here that for smoking cessation, um, one study showed that 80% of the par participants were smoke-free after six months from a single dose, right? And 60% uh, were still smoke-free up to 57 months later, right? After just a couple of two or three doses. So you're talking about a very powerful drug, nicotine, tobacco. I don't have a clue what's going on with the lighting. I'm just glad you're seeing it too. Yeah, yeah, it's not... You, <laughs> it, it contact high, I guess. <laughs> Um, but, um, but yeah, so it's very interesting, you know, when we look at the areas of the brain that, uh, psilocybin or psilocin is, is affecting, again, psilocin is a metabolite of psilocybin that is a docking to the eight of uh, the five HT two a receptor, which then, uh, basically affects the cortical system and the limbic system, right? Of the brain. More specific, I want to point out the limbic system here because it contains the amygdala where our fear response and trauma are. And 
And so when a child has trauma from abuse or a soldier has trauma from war, we actually get damage in the amygdala. And in, in CAT scans and, 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 and brain imaging, we can see that the amygdala is actually damaged. It's, it's not lighting up. There's, there's, there, it's like it's bruised, if we would call it that, right? And so what ends up uh, happening is that as it sort of atrophies, um, and flares, it, it puts the body into this fight or flight mode. And so that PTSD becomes more and more progressed, uh, especially as we age. But for whatever unknown reasons, psilocybin, when it, it ingested, it affects the amygdala and, and recalibrates it, like hitting the reset button on your computer when it's wigging out and has been shown to actually be able to address really severe um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, uh, patients, which is why I think much of the federal funding is coming in towards moving uh, into, you know, clinical uh, trials and research, starting with, you know, the most afflicted of PTSD being um, the veterans. <laughs> now, the, it's also shown greater functionality and connectivity uh, to the brain. So a normal brain has, you know, the, the, the references and connections um, that we would expect. You know, you're, you are you, I am me, I see you over there. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, these lights are over there and the color is making the room lit up. Whereas when you're on psilocybin, it actually creates such interconnectivity, you start to not be able to differ differentiate between you and the other person. You feel like you are one, right? You can't differentiate between you and the light because you're seeing rainbows everywhere and you're just bathed in light rainbows. And so you start to have all of these very interesting interconnections that would not be had without this substance, right? And this uh, next uh, image is actually showing some of that, where you can see the graph in red and blue is the brain functioning in our conscious and, and, and sleeping states. So when I'm asleep, I'm internal. I don't, I'm, I don't have a clue what's going on external in the external world. When I'm awake, I don't dream, right? I'm awake and everything's external. So when I'm asleep and I'm dreaming, it's all internal. But when I'm awake, you know, I'm not dreaming and I'm, and I'm living in my external world. When you ingest psilocybin, it shows that actually those patterns in the brain actually become coherent. So you're actually waking and sleeping at the same time, right? Which is a trippy thing. And I think anybody who's ever eaten mushrooms knows that feeling. It's like I'm dreaming, but I'm awake, clearly, like walking through the rainbow, you know, lightning. Um, and it's just one of those interesting things that we can now test and see what it's actually doing, you know, um, to understand greater, uh, you know, potentials for being able to use this in a clinical setting uh, or even recreational for that matter. Um, and so here we see, um, you know, at a 12-month follow-up, 13 participants, which is 86.7%, rated their psilocybin experience among the five most personally meaningful and spiritual significant experience of their lives next to a childbirth or next to a, a, a marriage or death, right? And so it's pretty much at the top of human experiences from, you know, from the clinical research shown that people that have these experiences consider it a very significant turning point, pivotal point of their life. Oh, that, that, I believe that was a mega dose, a large, like 3.5 grams to 5 grams, getting you out into the, or in, into the cosmos. Um, and so without going into too much time, I, I know I'm probably running out of time here, but I just wanted to, you know, uh, draw a couple of these slides so I can keep moving. Uh, compared to traditional antidepressants, which require daily dose, hallucinogens can show months of benefit after just a single dose. So they've seen... A clinical trials where one single megadose has cured depression for an entire year or more without taking medications every day and harming your kidneys or your liver or, you know, or whatever other systems of your brain that those are, you know, uh, uh, affecting. And so, you know, we're seeing here at a baseline of depression severity, you can see that after a dose of, of, of psilocybin mushrooms, you know, the, the, the degree or level of depression, or, uh, depression uh, su you know, subsides quite a bit. Um, this is kind of a funny image. I just thought I'd throw it in there. It might be offensive to some people, but I just thought it was just too much to pass up. Um, <laughs> but it's kind of telling the story a little bit. Uh, yeah. And so um, moving on, um, let's see, mushrooms health benefits, uh, Hippocrates, obviously I'm a big fan. Um, 
And the Greeks did a lot of things, but I think Hippocrates nailed it. Uh, there are different fungi that actually feed on radiation. The black molds I was telling you about can actually consume radioactive materials and live in radioactive environments. Here's an oyster mushroom eating <coughs> motor oil that has just been changed out of a car. They don't really care. They will eat anything. They have no, they have no you know, uh, uh, um, they're not picky eaters. Right? They will eat whatever. They'll eat your body. They'll eat your flesh. They'll eat the, the, the cardboard. They'll eat this wood. They'll, they'll eat oil. They'll eat anything. Uh, they eat radiation. They're very powerful creatures, which makes them very difficult to kill if they're infecting your body. Again, going back to the antifungal component, you know, you can't just go on a diet and not eat like sugar and expect those things to die. They'll just eat your body instead, you know? So, um, it's one of those things, again, I think for many, many millennia, we have been afflicted by fungal infections. We just have had no idea how to a attack or address. Um, so Lichtenberg figures, I know I probably have two, three minutes left, but I just wanted to show you, this is electricity running through a salt water on pieces of wood. There's electricity running through a glass pane, right, that with this electrode, high voltage, and we can see clearly that it's making these beautiful mycelial patterns, right? Here's going to go tap it. Bam, made a rose. How about that? And so we can see here in these other Lichtenberg figures, like lightning or through the glass. Um, and then here we see mycelium in a Petri dish in a lab. And then here's high voltage in a Petri dish. And so we're starting to see the pattern of nature here that shows and expresses itself at every scale from fungi um, in a Petri dish, through liquid crystals, uh, from minerals and water, uh, from brain cells and from dark matter in the universe. This is a coherent structure, right, that is, it, that is moving through and through, even the continental United States and everywhere around the world. These are the river systems, right? It's mycelium. We live on a big liquid crystalline mycelium planet and in a big liquid crystalline fractal universe, right, that are transmitting ions and minerals and water and all kinds of energy, electricity, magnetism. It's very powerful understanding. Here's under a microscope some crystals. Right? They're doing the same things, using the same patterns of nature through the Fibonacci and phi ratios that show these very beautiful fractals, images, whether it's a crystal you know, from minerals, whether it's biology from fungi, or whether it's a metal, that's copper crystal growing. That's a, that's a, that's a rock there, that's a stone, right? And so just trying to give you an idea of some of these things. Here's actually lightning that struck uh, people, human beings. This is what happened when human beings get struck by lightning, right? And you can see the pretty cool tat that it makes on there. That's actually my chest after a sweat lodge ceremony. And it actually does a very similar crystalline pattern. It's sort of not the easiest to see, but it's, it's there, you know? And here we see lion's mane and, and stalactites, stalagmites in caves, right? And these are all, here's fungi and here are coral reef under the ocean. You almost can't tell a difference. You know, you, you, you really almost can't. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty trippy to, to, to consider that. There's, you know, can, uh, there's, there's, there's trichomes on cannabis flower and there's anoki, anoki mushrooms, anokitaki, flamelina valutypes, right? And so just to kind of give you guys a little bit of that, you know, that, that connection because mushrooms are not just for tripping. They're not just for eating either. They literally wire the entire, you know, earth together with the universe. I mean, that's not an exaggeration, right? It's a really powerful effect that we see, you know, through and through at every scale, whether under the ocean or in caves or, you know, on, you know, from lightning discharges, uh, from crystallization and patterns on earth. You know, again, I'll just go through a couple of these because I know my time's out. But again, it's just providing some essence of, of the meaning of what we're talking about here, which is really the universal intelligence um, that are expressed through fungi and ourselves. I mean, you look at your veins on your arms, you know, you look at the, 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 the structure of your nervous system, it's the same thing. We're all part of this story. And to understand it more clearly allows us to really participate as opposed to just be thrown around and reacting to the, you know, the chaos of, of the world and not understanding what's going on. And at the end of the day, it's like, oh, wait, it's a fungal infection. I need to deal with that, right, <laughs> before this gets out of hand. And so um, thank you guys very much. I don't think we have time for questions, but I will be at my booth and uh, happy to take any questions. And thank you again for the time.